So, um, again, my name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, we are about to uh, enter a, a Certificate of Need hearing for Silver Pines. And at this point in time, I am going to designate Michael Barber, General Counsel for the Board, as the hearing officer and turn the meeting over to him. And before I do, Mike, um, is there some type of attendance that would be required that Abigail should take, or are you going to handle that? Um, I'll handle that. <clears throat> Thank you. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you've finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. So I don't know whose line that is, if if it's possible to figure that out and um, maybe try calling in again or something. Um, we'll just kind of proceed and see if see if it see if it works itself out. So as the chair said, uh, my name is Michael Barber. I'm the general counsel. I'll be serving as the uh, hearing officer for today's hearing. It is a hearing in the application of Silver Pines. Partners LLC for a certificate of need to develop a medically supervised withdrawal treatment center in Stowe, Vermont. The docket number for the case is GMCB 016 19 CON. We are uh, holding this hearing primarily remotely in light of the ongoing health emergency and the governor's executive order. Uh, the most recent of which directed Vermonters to stay at home and leave only for essential reasons. We do have uh, a physical location uh, for this hearing uh, in compliance with the open meetings law. Um, that is our offices at 144 State Street, and we do have someone there in case um, in case someone shows up. So given that all the board members are participating remotely, I do need to start by making sure that um, uh, the board members and actually all participants can hear and be heard. So I'm going to start with the board members. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear okay? Everything is fine on my end. Member Holmes, can you hear okay? Yes, I can. Member Lunge, can you hear okay? Yes, thank you. Member Yusufer, can you hear okay? Yes, I can. And Member Pelham, can you hear okay? I can. Okay, thank you. So representing the applicant today is Dr. William katz uh, the CEO and managing partner of Silver Pines Partners, LLC. Dr. katz can you hear okay? Very well, thank you, Mike. We also have a court reporter on the line, Kim Sears, who will be transcribing today's proceedings. Ms. Sears, can you hear okay? I can, thank you. Great. So as the chair alluded to, normally we would have um, a sign-in sheet to document who is in attendance today. We can't do that remotely, obviously, um, but I can see uh, the people or the telephone numbers of the people who are on the call. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go down the list uh, of people that I see and ask that each person I call on um, state their name and if they are here representing an organization, the name of the organization. Uh, so I see Amarin Abergeli. Yes, Amarin Abergeli, Green Mountain Care Board. Okay, myself, Susan Barrett. So Susan is the executive director of the Green Mountain Care Board. Maybe she stepped away for a minute. Uh, Elena Barabee. Hi, Elena Barabee, Green Mountain Care Board. Abigail Connolly. Yes, Abigail Connolly, Green Mountain Care Board. Donna Jerry. Green Mountain Care Board. Jessica Mendizable. Hi, Jessica Mendizable, Green Mountain Care Board. Thanks. Uh, Janine Morrison. Janine Morrison, Green Mountain Care Board, and there are members of the public present at the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now I'm going to phone numbers, people who don't uh, come up as names for me. So uh, a phone number with the last four digits, 8646. That's Doug Moses. Uh, William Casparell invited me to the meeting. I'm not exactly sure, Willie. Do you want me part of this? Uh, just for, for everybody, uh, uh, the, there's a... Uh, a, a partner in construction, and and Doug works for Bullrock Corporation, who's in charge of the refitting of the building that we will eventually lease from them. So, Doug, you don't have to be here. I appreciate you joining in. Uh, more than welcome to have you. Um, if there are questions about construction and construction potential construction delays because of the COVID-19 situation. It may be helpful to have you on board. Mike, I think okay. it would be helpful if, if he stayed on because there may be questions. Uh, Not a problem. Okay. Thank you. So phone number, last four digits, 4028. This is Kylie Kuiper from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Thank you. Phone number, last four digits, 2505. Hi, this is Jennifer Collis, Government Relations for UVM Medical Center. Thank you. Last four digits, 1970. I think that might be our office, Mike. Got it. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's our conference room um, phone. Yeah. Thank you. We're learning. We're learning. That's the stealth number. All right. Nine, three, one, four. Excuse me. That's me, the court reporter. Okay, thanks, Kim. And then last four, seven, zero, zero, zero. This is Greg Beldock from Bull Rock Corporation also. Okay. Thank you. And I see Orca Media is on uh, and the rest we've already gone through. So now that I've asked literally everyone on the call to unmute themselves and speak, if you could please just check and make sure that you have your lines muted again, that would be great. So uh, the order of today's proceedings will be, um, first the applicant will be uh, going through a presentation. He will be sharing this presentation uh, with the board members uh, and others participating via Skype. Um, copies of the presentation have been posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website for members of the public to follow along. Um, the easiest way to access those documents is by going to the 2020 board meeting information tab and finding the documents for today's meeting. Dr. Katzbrill, as you go through your presentation, if you could please just identify the page number of the slides you're on so that um, Anyone who doesn't have uh, this um, kind of electronic Skype access and who's on just by phone can can follow along. I will. Thank you very much. Uh, for the sake of the court reporter and others, I'll also ask the board members to please hold your questions until after the presentation is finished. Um, after the presentation is finished, uh, I will be calling on board members individually um, to see if they have questions. Um, following board member questions, we will take public comment, and then following public comment, I'll adjourn the meeting, or adjourn, sorry, join the hearing and turn the meeting back over to the chair. So, um, Dr. Katz Burrell, if you, um, before we start Mike? your presentation, yes? Do you this? need to swear in the witnesses? I'm getting there. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, so if you could um, please raise your right hand. Can you see it? I do. <laughs> Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn it over to you um, to start sharing and start your presentation. Thank you, Mike.
Can everybody see the presentation? Not yet. We can. Excellent. Thank you so much again. Thank you for the for the opportunity. Appreciate very much everybody being here. Uh, most of you I have seen this uh, material before. Uh, the presentation that I am going to go through is a summary of. Um, the original CON application that was submitted on November 5th, 2019, and um, then uh, three sets of uh, responses to uh, the Green Mountain Care Board questions, uh, 80 questions in total in, in three sets. Um, and, and I'm going to do this a couple of times through the presentation. I really want to thank uh, Donna Jerry, uh, Michael Barber, I, I know there were a lot of other reviewers um, that uh, I'm not aware of their names, but I have to thank them for uh, the very, very quick turnaround and the very, very close read of the proposal. I think the questions that they asked uh, were terrific, and uh, they, they made the uh, the project uh, much more solid. Uh, so I appreciate uh, the care that uh, they took in uh, reviewing the proposal, the complex proposal, and they did it um, very, very quickly and very thoroughly. So with, with lots of thanks. And <clears throat> uh, the summary here just would like to give you an overview of what I want to do. I think that everybody uh, on this call is very much aware of the um, epidemic of addiction that we are in the midst of, now joined by another epidemic. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to move through that uh, rather quickly. It's background uh, material that uh, I believe everybody on this call is more or less aware of. And then concentrate on, on, on Silver Pines, uh, the vision that we have, the mission that we have developed for ourselves, the specifics of uh, the project, uh, focusing on the very um, individualized clinical care process that we are suggesting, uh, the team that I hope I will actually um, assemble, uh, the timeline that we have in mind, uh, the timeline that is station was pre-COVID-19, so clearly will have to be modified, uh, and then um, I don't know if you all had an opportunity to see the formal response that I submitted to the um, series of concerns from ADAP and, and the Department of Mental Health questions that came in uh, in the last round. And so I have added them as an appendix. Happy to go through them if um, you feel like uh, uh, you want me to address those specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm planning, uh, as Mike suggested, to go through the presentation uh, until the summary. At that point, stop for questions. If you want me to proceed and go through uh, the specific answers to the questions that are shown in the appendix, I'll be happy to do so. So I'm starting the presentation now. I'm, I'm going to, uh, th this is slide number five. Uh, five out of uh, a total of uh, 46 slides. Um, we are in the, uh, again, uh, a lot of the language here. I just need to couch it, obviously, in relative terms, given what's happening today with COVID-19. But uh, addiction is uh, raging, as you all know. We have a crisis that I think is going to get, unfortunately, worse because of COVID-19. My guess is that uh, the social distancing uh, is going to actually lead to uh, the problem getting uh, worse rather than better, certainly in the short term. And one of the reasons that we suggest that the epidemic has not abated, though it has been raging for at least the last decade, is that the treatment of addiction has not been particularly effective. And one of the reasons that we suggest that that's the case is that the treatment has been uh, fragmented and not particularly individualized. It's uh, basically a one-size-fits-all approach, 
And we think that that's one of the reasons that we haven't really been all that effective decreasing the incidence of uh, this chronic condition. Uh, the numbers are uh, enormous. Uh, again, I, I believe that you are more or less familiar with the magnitude of the problem. What is interesting is not so much the size of the problem, which is depressing in many ways, but the fact uh, that very, very few people actually, um, around 11 percent, get the treatment in a specialized facility. And, and that is where I believe Silver Pines is adding to the landscape of treating addiction uh, in Vermont and nationally. Um, the uh, consequences, as, as you know, in terms of human life is staggering. Uh, if we uh, add uh, individuals that die from uh, drug overdoses to the people that die from alcohol-related causes, we're looking at almost 160,000 people in this country. Uh, and uh, Vermont actually does uh, contribute to that total um, in terms of um, number of deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Vermont is on the high end of the spectrum. And you can see from this slide, I am now on slide eight. Uh, showing the trend of overdose deaths, um, they have tripled in the last 10 years. Uh, and it is particularly uh, a, a affliction, a chronic condition for, for males, uh, but uh, the, the, the trend is actually across the population. And uh, it doesn't seem, as you can see from this graph, to be slowing down on the country, it seems to be accelerating. And it is across the nation. Um, it is particularly bad in, in, in the Midwestern states, uh, in New England. Um, this uh, red uh, circle that I have on slide number nine is uh, the radius, the circle um, of um, catchment area for silver pines. And, and as you can see, we are unfortunately in the middle, or fortunately from the point of view of the need that we're trying to address um, in the middle, it's the eye of the storm, right? And this circle is um, has a radius of 800 miles. And we, we chose that thinking that we are um, going to address patients within a two-hour flight of Burlington, Vermont. I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's the incidence of this chronic condition. Uh, I would like to address a little bit how in Vermont we are prepared to deal with that. Uh, there is only one other facility in Vermont that has the level of medical supervision that we are going to be offering. For those of you who are familiar with the classifications, the ASM 3.7, um, only the, Burl the uh, Brattleboro Retreat offers that level of um, care in Vermont. And it is a level of care that we believe is cost-effective. Uh, it is an expensive care to provide, but in terms of the downstream costs that it saves, it's a very good investment. So that's the background. That's what actually led us to think about this project being a um, good addition to Vermont. And the, the, the vision that we develop for this facility is to develop one of what used to be called a center of excellence, a place that will be known for the quality of the treatment that we provide. Uh, we want to be known as one of the best treatment centers for addiction, medically supervised treatment in the country. 
and uh, we have a very specific mission and for us it is to create an inflection point in the trend line that we showed you uh, nationally would be a little bit too ambitious but certainly in Vermont we would like to see us having a role to play as many other people are already in the community trying to do so to add to the efforts by providing a evidence base individualized this is important coordinated medical care medical care treatment Specifically, the project is uh, in Stowe, uh, Vermont, has uh, 16 double rooms, 32 bed facility. Uh, it is a very, very pretty, private, very discreet, very nicely landscape um, location. It's a building that used to be a, a hockey academy for those of you who are familiar with Mountain Road in Stowe. Uh, used to be the North American Hockey Academy. Uh, this is a building that uh, has been purchased by uh, the uh, Bull Rock Corporation. They are refitting it. Uh, it's They're working with us to create a um, world-class facility. Um, the Bull Rock Corporation has a long history of experience in building healthcare facilities uh, in, in, in the memory um, business. Uh, they uh, had nursing homes. They, they understand uh, very well the type of uh, care uh, that needs to be put into uh, delivering to patients a, a peaceful, a uh, centering uh, experience. Uh, the, the treatment, again, will be a 24-hour medically supervised uh, treatment. Um, we will actually work with uh, opioid alcohol and uh, sedative use disorders. Uh, we will have uh, counseling and coordination of care in a community-based setting. Uh, we are providing a stabilization treatment program that is seven to ten day treatment. This is important. I know that we had, it, it was uh, an issue uh, that raised some questions and we'll be very happy to talk about why we chose uh, this length of time, but it's a seven to day treatment um, modality with uh, a, a very intense, customized post discharge uh, planning and support that we're planning to provide. Um, and we will have a, a systematic tracking of medical outcomes. This is a, a key component of our concept. Uh, medical outcomes is one of the areas that I have been involved for more than 25 years. Uh, I understand the importance of tracking what we do in order to improve the operations that we have in place. So this is part of this organizational learning that is an integral part of the values of Silver Pines. The idea is to have uh, eventually a national reputation. Uh, again, we are going to uh, target um, the, uh, the Northeast uh, all the way to uh, the Midwest, Chicago, being a two-hour direct flight to Burlington, Vermont, and uh, the southern part of, um, of Quebec and Ontario. Uh, specifically and intensively within that 800-mile circle, we'll be uh, addressing a 300-mile uh, area that uh, contains uh, Montreal, uh, Boston, uh, New York City, and Albany. Uh, we, we are going to be focusing on that area and we are, as part of our program, providing transportation. That is, we are 
going to provide uh, patients and their families the ability for us to go and get the patient back into the clinic if that's what they need. Uh, the facility is privately funded. We're not asking the state for any sort of contributions or subsidies. Um, all the proceeds that we're raising through uh, uh, that the private fund will go directly to operations. And um, as uh, some of you may have seen uh, from our uh, P&L projections, we hope to um, break even by the end of uh, second year. We have uh, made a commitment uh, also of being uh, an important part of the environment and community in Vermont that treats addiction. Uh, we have uh, made the commitment to allocate 1% of our profits uh, as grants to community-based organizations. The idea is to create an independent board um, of uh, seven individuals that will actually receive this 1% uh, in profits and then allocate it as the board sees fit. Uh, without uh, any intervention from uh, the partners in Silver Pine. The reimbursement model is a private pay only. Uh, again, I know that that has raised some questions, which we'll be happy to address. Uh, but this private pay only model allows us to deliver the highest level of care with one of the highest staff to patient ratios in the country. Um, and to provide a lot of other um, ancillary services that we believe will make the treatment at Silver Pine nationally recognized. Uh, we're investing in state-of-the-art technology. Uh, we're developing a series of uh, mathematical models that will help us, we believe, um, fine-tune the effectiveness of the treatment. Uh, very, very importantly, particularly uh, right now in the state of um, uh, freefall that the economy is going through, we are planning to uh, create uh, 55 uh, very well-paying jobs in Vermont by year three. And this private pay model allows us to have, we believe, a long-term sustainability. So in terms of, of, of the state of Vermont, I think we are going to create jobs. Uh, we are going to add to uh, tax revenues, and we are asking really for nothing in return, obviously other than the certificate of need, but um, <clears throat> no financial contribution. I am moving now to slide number 16, which shows you the, um, the expected admissions. Uh, we, we are uh, expecting a total of 365 admissions on year one. Uh, the number in parentheses, 31%, represents the percentage of total capacity. So we are planning to be basically a third full in year one. And as you can see, year two and year three, our capacity goes from 31% in year one to 79% in year three. And we expect the number of Vermont residents that will be treated at the facility to go from 39 in, in year one to uh, 90. And um, it's, um, uh, if you look at the bottom of this table, uh, we show you the calculations that we performed, the assumptions that we made in uh, determining those percentages. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the process of uh, clinical care that we're going to be delivering now. And <clears throat> this is slide number 18. And I think there are three basic uh, points that I would like to, to make. Uh, one is that we have constructed the clinical process 
to deliver what we expect is going to be better outcomes. Better outcomes uh, as measured by increased long-term abstinence, uh, higher rates of sobriety, um, decreased rates of relapse, and fewer medical and psychological complications. Again, I want to reiterate that we are going to be systematically tracking these outcomes for every single patient that enters our facility. The, uh, the economics of um, detoxification and sterilization of uh, patients uh, has been documented uh, several times. Uh, they yield cost savings. Um, addiction is or creates frequent use, much higher frequency of use of other medical services. And we believe that by effectively decreasing rates of relapse, we will have a long-term long impact on saving, savings for the healthcare system as a, as a whole. And then um, part of what we do very well, you know, I teach the course on continuous improvement here in the business school at, at UVM, uh, is this notion of organizational learning, understanding what's working, what's working best, what is not working, and, and having a very, very quick feedback loop that allows us to improve continuously. Uh, I am on, on slide number 19, uh, just showing again this notion that without intervention, um, substance use disorders lead to much higher costs in medical care. We hope to have a, a major impact, again, locally at least, on uh, the incidence of um, substance use disorders. Uh, <clears throat> The one to go through the, this table in, in great detail on page 20, uh, it, it shows you um, the breakdown step by step of what uh, we are planning uh, to do. Um, we have gone through the process on the left-hand side under Silver Pines process. You, you see the six stages of um, the clinical process, pre-admission all the way through post-discharge, and we have identified critical success factors to each and every one of those phases. And uh, this is what will drive our training, this is what will drive our hiring, um, and this is what will drive our assessment of quality. We will actually measure each and every one of these phases to make sure that we're delivering the specific uh, metrics that we have identified as being critical in each of those. There are some questions uh, as to our um, the, the length of our treatment being short, seven to ten days. It obviously then raises uh, the question of follow-up, and uh, we have concentrated uh, a lot of our energies in thinking about how we are going to uh, make sure that we are providing a continuity of care to our patients and providing them with uh, placement and treatment uh, post-discharge. And <clears throat> here are some of the uh, post-discharge follow-up activities that we'll be performing. On slide 22 uh, is the type of data that we are going to be collecting. Uh, as you know, we have made the offer of sharing our data with uh, the appropriate uh, government agencies uh, that are interested in following addiction. We will be sharing our outcome measures. Uh, we will be actually reporting them. Um, and we will be, uh, as I said before, tracking them systematically. 
slide number 23, uh, reiterating that uh, our length of stay on average will be between 7 and 10 days. Uh, the program will be totally voluntary, um, and uh, we will make sure that uh, every single patient will actually go through the full uh, treatment and uh, has a very well-planned, structure supported departure from treatment. The team, um, I apologize for this introduction that is a little bit longish about who I am. Donna Jerry very nicely uh, suggested that I should give the board a sense of, uh, of who I am. Um, so, uh, what I think uh, I would like to say very quickly, just to summarize all these bullet points, is that um, uh, I've been in Vermont for 37 years. I live in Stowe. Um, Vermont has been extremely good to me, and uh, I would like to be very good to Vermont. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, be uh, engaged in, in other businesses that I think have contributed to um, to the well-being of the state. Uh, one of my uh, major contributions was the redesign of the MBA program here at uh, the Grossman School of Business. Uh, we created uh, in 2015 a totally new MBA. I was a founding director and a major designer of that program. It is now ranked number one in the country on sustainability and innovation. So I, I do have a commitment uh, to, to quality, to, to excellence. Um, you may actually wonder how a professor of business goes into addiction uh, treatment. Um, I had the luck of uh, working with a stupendous group of psychiatrists on developing a what is now a nationally recognized risk of suicide prediction tool. Uh, my background in uh, artificial intelligence, in uh, expert systems, in neural networking uh, overlap with their interest in trying to do something that nobody has done before, which was the prediction of short-term risk of suicide, what we call imminent risk of suicide. And uh, through that work, which has won several awards, um, including some national uh, awards of, of note, um, I started to realize the tremendous uh, public health problem that suicide represented. And through my work in suicide, as we tried to apply this tool to several different populations, and we started to look at the rate of suicide in the um, substance use disorder populations. We looked at some of the data that uh, uh, basically pointed to half of the death by overdose being intentional. And that really was, to me, uh, surprising uh, because it immediately doubled the number of suicides in this country. The, the official number of people that die by suicide is 42,000 per year, uh, but there are close to 100,000 deaths by uh, drug overdose. So if you take half of those as being intentional, that will be 50, and that will make 92,000 deaths by suicide. And that would be, it is a staggering number. Uh, and I started to uh, put together here at UVM a group of faculty interested in what I call the death of despair, overdose and suicide, uh, to look at the social determinants of those death of despair. And that led me to uh, the question of how can it be? How can we have such a high incidence of death? This is... Uh, I would really 
suggest unacceptable. And uh, I started to ask questions of people that are experts in this area about addiction treatment. And this is how I got involved in thinking about developing a clinic that could deliver, that could make a difference. Small grain of you know, sand in the big beach of um, despair here, but at least trying to address it uh, on a personal level in an effective way. So th that's the background as to what brought me to uh, think about addiction, what brought me to actually do something about addiction. I am putting my, my money where my mouth is, where my intentions are. Um, I really would like to make a difference, and I'm making a difference, I hope, um, assuming that uh, you will consider the certificate of need uh, in a positive light in my backyard. Right. I, I really would like Stowe to become known for uh, treatment of addiction. Happy to answer any other questions about my background um, when I'm done. Uh, <clears throat> the team that I'm hoping to hire is uh, described on slide 26. Um, we will have, as uh, you know, 24-7 uh, medical uh, supervision. Uh, we will have a chief medical officer uh, that will uh, be uh, trained um, in, in addiction and will have a board certification in, in psychiatry. Um, we will have, uh, we think this is the numbers that you have in front of you are numbers that deal with um, year three, right? So we'll have three top-level executives. We'll have 37 clinical positions. We'll have eight admins. Um, not here, but uh, part of uh, the team will be a uh, kitchen staff. Uh, part of what we hope to do is a farm-to-table program that again will highlight some of the strength of, of Vermont um, farming community uh, altogether uh, by year three. Uh, we hope, we expect to have 55 employees working at Silver Pines. Uh, the timeline. Oh, much easier to look back because that's uh, what we know has happened. Uh, we started November 5th. Um, the last response to the set of questions um, was sent on February 20th. I believe that the process was closed on March 5th. Uh, we are now having uh, the hearing on March 25th, and so that's what brought us here. Uh, going to slide uh, 29, um, we are hoping to start credentialing with private insurance as soon as a certificate of need is, is, is awarded. Um, we uh, were hoping uh, of uh, hiring, licensing, and credentialing uh, critical staff on June 1st. Um, all of this was really based on the presumption that the construction of the building was going to be done uh, by July 15th. Uh, construction, as you know, right now has a stop uh, across Vermont in most cases. Um, uh, we are pausing to, um, for we don't know how long, certainly, we hope no more than a couple of months, but nobody obviously knows. Uh, so m much of these dates have to be adjusted in this uh, COVID-19 world that we are um, living today to recognize the reality of delays. And um, we are still committed, we hope, to um, open this year. September 1st was what we had in mind. We had actually uh, already started to identify individuals uh, that would actually join the team and so forth. Everything is a little bit on hold now. Uh, I certainly hope that we will be able to open our doors 
in 2020. Uh, I do believe that in a, a couple of months, we will have much greater visibility as to whether opening in 2020 is still realistic. Uh, the goal is there, and um, it's just a matter of being able to have the facility in place and the team in place. So in summary, uh, I would like uh, to close by saying that uh, we have built what I believe is a uh, clinical process that will give us distinction. Uh, and it will give us distinction because we are going to have better outcomes that we'll be able to report and for us to be successful, we need to demonstrate effectiveness. It is an individualized and integrated treatment modality that uh, we hope is going to uh, make Silver Pines a nationally known facility. We are planning, as uh, you were able to see from our financial um, reporting, that we will have a model in place that will allow us to uh, run a very, very high quality clinical care process in a sustainable fashion. The benefits to Vermont, this is on slide uh, 32, uh, my last slide, uh, unless you want me to go through the specific answers to the last set of questions and concerns from ADAP and DMH, um, is that we're offering a treatment option that does not currently exist in Vermont. Um, we, we believe that we are going to be treating up to 90 Vermonters per year. Uh, it may not sound like much, but it's 90 Vermonters that will have access to the best possible treatment that maybe doesn't exist right now. So 90 is better than none. Uh, we will create 55 well-paying jobs. Uh, we will be providing these financial grants uh, if we are uh, running uh, with uh, the level of success that we believe we will have uh, a profitable operation and, and give to those community organizations. Uh, we will make minimal demands on the Vermont healthcare system, and we believe that we'll be adding substantial tax revenues to the state. So with that, again, I am uh, at uh, your disposal, your discretion, and I can go on to uh, talk specifically about the concerns of ADP and um, DMH or, or stop here and take questions uh, uh, on other subjects. Um, so okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any board member who would like uh, Dr. Katzborough to proceed with um, the remainder addressing the concerns of ADAP and DMH. I think a quick uh, run through of those uh, would be actually helpful. With pleasure. So there were uh, five uh, concerns from um, ADAP, one concern from, from DMH, um, basically uh, ADAP was concerned, uh, first of all, with uh, Silver Pines creating a uh, workforce shortage or creating uh, pressures on the uh, current uh, workforce environment in Vermont. Um, and um, if you look at the numbers, the people that we are going to hire, the, we have a very high ratio of staff to patients. We are going to be hiring around 1%, 1.5% by, by year three 
of the existing, and maybe by year three they will be even more than the 424 um, staff that are in Vermont today. So um, uh, we believe that we are uh, not creating any um, undue pressures on what is considered to be insufficient staff to provide services in Vermont. We, we are aware that uh, that may be a concern, but certainly Silver Pines is not going to contribute in any significant way um, to those pressures. Um, uh, the second concern was a concern of um, uh, Silver Pine distorting in some way the uh, salaries of uh, professionals in Vermont. Um, my philosophy has always been in every business that I've run that you pay uh, the people that work for you the best possible salary. It's the smartest and tends to be the most cost effective way to run a business. You pay them well employees are going to work hard. I want the best possible employees at Silver Pines. I want to have the best possible staff at Silver Pines. I am proud of the fact that we are going to pay as well as we can to get the best possible skill level. So having said that, the numbers that we have proposed in our financial, um, in our PL, is completely in line with uh, the Blueprint for Health guidelines. We are right in the middle of that range. What we are going to do is uh, offer bonuses of performance and, 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 and certainly motivate individuals to uh, work hard and produce the best possible outcomes. But the salary base that we're providing or that we are planning to provide is in line with uh, the market in Vermont. Uh, a third concern from ADP was this uh, lack of connection to the rest of specialty treatment systems. And here, uh, I want to make sure that we all realize that there's a continuity of care, right? We, we are not doing everything in, in, in um, addiction treatment. We are doing a very specific aspect of it, a narrow one. We think we're going to do it very, very well, possibly as well as anybody else in the country. Um, but we are providing a very limited service. And this service, I think, is important. We'll be connected. We are going to make a tremendous effort to connect our clinic to all the community uh, organizations that are already doing a terrific job in Vermont. I think that, uh, you know, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg. I mean, we don't have a certificate of need, and so we have an idea for a project. And I think once we have a certificate of need, once we know that this clinic is going to be a reality, it's going to be all hands on deck to create all of the connections to ensure this continuity of care. So we are totally aware that this is a chain. We are only a link in that chain. We'll be connecting uh, I am convinced uh, from conversations that I've had with individuals in this environment, uh, the ability to create those connections. Um, again, same, same, the, the, the next, uh, I'm on uh, slide 39. Um, one of the uh, concerns from ADAP was that um, uh, we were offering uh, too short of a treatment, that there was no real evidence that these treatments were effective. Um, we very respectfully disagree with that statement. Uh, our thorough review of the literature, our conversations with experts in addiction tells us that uh, the 7 to 10 day is um, the sweet spot, if you will. It is the number of days that seem to provide uh, equal or better effectiveness of intervention for the least amount of time and expense. And um, we, we actually have given uh, in our response, uh, but we had already 
provided in our original certificate of need application uh, evidence for this. I want to make sure, again, very respectfully to the board, that the seven to 10 day detox program that we propose was not just a win. Uh, we could have uh, offered 14, 21, we could have gone into rehab. I mean, we chose this treatment modality because we believe that this treatment modality is extremely effective. And uh, we, we, we provided some of the evidence uh, in, in, the, um, in the response as well as in the original certificate of need. Uh, and finally, one of, of the concerns uh, that uh, ADAP uh, brought up was the, uh, that not all states have access to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders. That is true, but it's changing extremely quickly. Uh, as of 2018, which is the last uh, reported uh, statistic, more than 92% of the population live in a place with at least one uh, buprenorphine prescriber. And uh, the number of prescribers are increasing. The number of opioid treatment centers and programs in the country is increasing. And so we believe that um, uh, the individuals that will be discharged from Silver Pines uh, 10 to 7 day treatment are at no higher risk of overdose um, than any other treatment, and we believe actually that they will be at a much lower risk of overdose because of, of the care that we will take in placing our patients into a post-discharge um, uh, treatment. <clears throat> and then uh, the last uh, concern of ADAP is about neural network model that we are using. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a relevant concern. It says that the machine learning and neural network models that we have proposed have not been fully tested on the population they will be serving. It's absolutely true, but it's not the way that we are going to deliver care. We have a parallel system. Uh, we're going to have experts, uh, individuals that have been trained at the highest level of addiction treatment in this country, coming from the best fellowship programs in this country on addiction. We will have terrific uh, nursing staff, and they will be delivering the care, not the neural model. What I'm doing, and this is very close to my heart, this is part of my life work, is we are going to test in parallel a model that will try to replicate the expertise of these individuals so that eventually not only can we increase the consistency, that is, we will actually be training staff that has a much less level of experience, expertise, and skills with this model, but that we can contribute nationally to a uh, treatment of addiction that will be much more effective. The neural network works in two levels, please. The first one is by identifying patients. We've talked about this individualized treatment that Silver Pines is going to deliver. The individualized treatment is going to be drawn by physicians and will actually be tracked by this neural network. And eventually, we hope, that the neural network will be performing, quote unquote, just as well as the physicians. We will be actually adding a level of patient safety through this neural network. It will be basically a model that says, okay, physician, here's the patient, here's how it presents, the patient has a certain history uh, of, of addiction, a certain history of uh, rehabilitation, this is a substance that they, um, they abuse. Here is the type of treatment that best fit them. And the model will actually confirm or disagree with that selection. And we believe that in that 
the model is actually providing an extra layer of safety, an extra layer layer of um, of quality of care. But same uh, logic applies to how we are going to place patients into um, how we're going to discharge them and how we're going to actually place these patients once they're done with our clinic. We will have a post-discharge uh, and discharge experts that will be handling that, but we'll be building a mathematical model to basically confirm that those choices make sense. And over time, we hope the model will be performing just as well as the physicians. So yes, they haven't been fully tested. We are not using them as the main source of care. We do hope, however, that uh, by year two or three, right, these models, I don't know if we have some people on, on the board that, that understand or have worked with neural networks uh, and how they work, but as the patient base increases, the intelligence of the model increases. And we hope that by year three, when we'll have treated hopefully more than a thousand patients, the models will start behaving in a way that would be of help, uh, support for the clinical staff. And um, by the way, the uh, on, on slide 43, I'm sorry, I just went too fast through it. Uh, um, I'm sorry, 42. Um, I just mentioned the work. This is a very similar work. I've done it uh, in, in several uh, conditions, uh, chronic conditions, low back pain being one uh, chronic conditions. We've uh, done and followed the same model with um, uh, with the imminent risk of suicide project that I mentioned a second ago. So those are the concerns from ADAP. Uh, and uh, from the Department of Mental Health, uh, their main concern was that we were going to uh, possibly increase, uh, put pressure on uh, local medical and psychiatric uh, emergency departments in, in, in the state, um, that non-Vermonters were going to come into the state and actually divert some of those resources. Um, uh, the numbers that uh, we are planning to have, if we execute perfectly on our plan, uh, as you can see, uh, the numbers are insignificant in terms of the total annual uh, ED visits, um, uh, both at Copley, which is the hospital that is closest to the clinic, or to UEMMC, where they may actually need inpatient psychiatric care. Um, so the, uh, you know, a, a very good snow fall uh, in the middle of winter will bring more people to Vermont and will bring more people possibly to the emergency room because they break a leg or they hit a tree uh, skiing than what we are going to do at Silver Pines. The numbers that we uh, and, and the numbers that we're predicting may require emergency department attention are all based on the literature across uh, national programs, and, and the numbers would be very, very small. The last thing I would like to say to that effect is that we believe that on the contrary, right, if we are going to bring uh, up to 90 uh, Vermonters to Silver Pines and treat them effectively uh, of an SUD, that we uh, will decrease the impact, the pressure on the health care system in Vermont. We believe that the more uh, <clears throat> the, the Vermonters we treat, the less the impact we're going to have in the state's medical uh, system, certainly the emergency medical system. So taken all together, uh, we believe that the impact that we're going to have is not really one of increasing pressure on emergency departments in the community, but that ultimately what we will do is uh, have a beneficial effect 
uh, and free resources in emergency departments across the state, certainly in the northern part of the state. Happy to expand on any aspect of the presentation or these um, responses to the concerns from ADAP and DMH. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to the board members for questions. And like I said earlier, I will, um, just to keep things um, understandable for folks and the court reporter be calling on board members one at a time. So um, board member Lunge, do you want to kick things off? Do you have questions for the presenter? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation uh, and the materials. There's a lot of uh, good information in the packet and I appreciated getting the thorough information. Um, my first, I have a couple questions related to your reimbursement model. So, uh, so I wondered if you could give me a little more detail around the self-pay versus interaction with insurance. Uh, when I was going through the materials, I did note that um, in answers to the questions related to bad debt, you had indicated that you're expecting self-pay up front, uh, which would obviously minimize the bad debt. Um, and in reviewing your patient financial policy form, which was page 23 in response to question three, um, it does look like your plan is uh, for folks to individually ask for reimbursement from their insurance company after paying with whatever documentation you provide. Um, but I also noted in uh, some of your other materials where you were explaining what would be included in the upfront cost versus what would be billed separately that you had indicated that labs, for example, might be billed to insurance. So, um, so I just wanted to get you to expand a little bit on, on how that's gonna work. Well, I think that, you know, we uh, hope that the charge that we are going to make will include every service that we deliver, including lab services, including medication. So it is a, uh, as you said, self-pay. Uh, it They will actually pay upfront. We will provide all documentation needed with their insurance company of choice. Uh, but all the uh, the lab costs are going to be uh, um, included in our original charge. Okay. Um, and so could you explain a little bit then why about the, why you'd be credentialing with insurance companies? That's so when a patient, submits the uh, reimbursement information that you're already credentialed? That's exactly right, yes, to facilitate the process of reimbursement to the patient. Okay. Um, and who on your staff would be working on that piece of it? Well, we're going to have the executive director that is going to be – let me just go back. Uh, Mike, do you still want me to keep the um, – the slides up. Um, I don't know what the process is here in terms of uh, if you want to see my face, if you rather see the slides. I mean, I'm uh, I don't know what the protocol is. Um, well, I can actually see both, so I'm okay. Oh. But whatever Mike prefers. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's it's uh, kind of up to you. I mean, um, I think it's helpful for me at least to have you be able to to go through the, the presentation, but I can see your face and it's, it okay. might be weird if you can't see board members' faces as they're asking questions. So it's really your preference. Right. Right. Well, I cannot see you, so there you go. Um, because the, uh, the slides are taking over all the screen. So, you know, if you look at our team, the, the executive director, uh, we have a, uh, we'll have an accountant that will actually be tracking uh, the, uh, all our relationships with the insurance um, company. And we will have um, 
Uh, what I hope is a, a good relationship with these insurance companies, there, and there's not going to be uh, that that many, uh, but we will have actually the executive director in charge of credentialing. Okay. Um, and who would be in charge of the reimbursement, like getting the paperwork together for the patient for reimbursement? Yeah, again, you know, uh, we will have most likely our accountant who, uh, you know, the accountant is going to deal with all aspects financial. Okay. Uh, the business at the beginning is not going to be uh, all that busy and, and, and complicated, and so the accountant will be the person that manages that process. Okay, thank you. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more generally about why you chose the self-pay model as opposed to being open to all payers. You know, it, it's a matter of a business uh, model that um, what we started, the, the concept from the beginning was a concept of providing the highest level of care. Uh, for me, that was absolutely critical. You know, after discussing what was needed uh, in Vermont in particular, but across the country, uh, you know, I, I actually went and visited many, uh, I think I visited 14 different detox clinics across the country, um, seeing all sorts of uh, models. And I realized that the ones that I wanted to emulate were uh, fully 24-7 medically supervised clinics. Um, it is an expensive model to sustain. Uh, there aren't many uh, across the country because of that. And uh, to me, in order to be able to sustain the highest possible level of quality when it comes to clinical care, we just needed to have the cash flow to sustain that. And, uh, you know, for, for us, the point that there is, as you said uh, so well, no bad debt that we really don't need to be worrying about cash flow from that point of view. Um, it gave me, gave investors into this uh, facility uh, a level of understanding of how we could be sustainable in the long term. Thank you. Um, my next question is around the upfront patient payment. So. I know that your model has a real emphasis on individualized treatment, um, and I, could you explain a little bit about how you're going to know prior to someone getting to your facility how much to charge them, whether it's seven days, 10 days, 12 days, eight days? No, you know the the uh, this is a, a thank you. This is a, a a good question. The idea here is that we are going to assume that the treatment is going to take ten days, and we are going to plan on a charge for ten days. Uh, if the patient, for whatever reason, whether from you know a voluntary decision that we want to leave halfway through. Um, uh, we will actually prorate what we, um, we charge them. But the assumption is going to be that they're going to be with us for 10 days. And we are going to structure the treatment on that basis. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, all right, hold on just one second. I got to shuffle some papers around and find my other notes. Um, Thank you. So the, my next question is about the discharge planning yeah. um, and is really a follow-up on some of the ADAP um, concerns. So yeah. uh, I, I hear what you've said about ensuring that you're just a link in the chain and understanding that your service is specific and uh, narrowly tailored for uh, its particular purpose, uh, but I was a little concerned when I looked at the projections around that you had provided around the number of hours that people would be spending 
post discharge with your patient. So okay. uh, hold on just one second. Uh, there was a chart that you provided in response to question three that is on page twenty on uh, page five. Um, and uh, it indicates that in year one, you would expect that the average number of follow up uh, per person would be an hour for the first month, half an hour for the next two to six months, and then less after that for a total of five hours. And it just seems like when you're trying to work with providers within a uh, two hour flight radius, um, that 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 may be challenging to do in that little time. So could you speak a little bit more about how you came up with those hour estimates? Um, they're, they're, uh, again, you know, your thank you uh, for the, the question. The question is um, for us whether we specifically know how long it's going to take. I ask how much time is being uh, used to discharge. You know, again, uh, I talk to other operators that uh, do this type of uh, discharge planning. We got an estimate of that amount. Um, for us, it is a very, we believe that we are going to distinguish ourselves on the way we actually discharge patients and we place them. That is going to be a priority for what we do. Uh, it may be that the number of hours may be greater than five. What I can tell you is that early on, we are going to have only 30% capacity. We're going to have a lot of time on staff hands to actually do uh, placement. It may be longer than five hours. Uh, we will actually assess them after year one. This numbers that we showed are numbers that uh, were based on interviewing people that have spent time on discharge. So it's an estimate. Uh, I, I think it's a, an estimate that makes sense for us and that reflects the type of, um, of care that we want to put on that task. We may have to, I think your implication is that it may be low uh, and you may be very, you may be right. We will know very quickly. But we think they're reasonable based on what we heard from other operators. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm good for now, Mike. I might have one follow-up question later, but um, I suspect somebody else will ask it, so. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, board member Yusufer. Do you have questions? Um, I do. Uh, first, uh, really glad to see the MBA program is going so well. Um, I was on the inaugural board of that in 2015, so not yes. sure everyone. Yes. <laughs> yes. But good to see that kick off. Um, you know, clearly there's a need for additional addiction treatment in the U.S., and, you know, would like to see success here in Vermont. But I definitely have some concerns on the success of this model, you know, based on some of the assumptions. And that's really going to drive, you know, a bunch of my or several of my questions. So I first want to look at the landscape in both Vermont and in nationally. So um, just first going back to something that Robin was talking about, about reimbursement, um, there was something on page 21 of the original the, of the original con talking about contracting with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for patients. Um, and it, so, is there are you planning for Vermont residents to do that, or what, what was that? You know, again, what what we wanted to do, and this uh, has evolved. But yes, I mean, you know, for us having uh, relationships with insurance companies, right, looking for this credentialing of our program with uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is important. I mean, we we believe that uh, they will be one of the main 
in Vermont and being credentialed by them will be important for us. So the answer is yes. Again, uh, we will support patients by providing all the documentation required by the insurance companies, but we will not take insurance directly now. Okay. And then um, since some of your comparisons and benchmarks were against um, Brattleboro, the Brattleboro Retreat and, or the Brattleboro um, Addiction Center, and you talked about the 10,500 was kind of, I think, the average there. And just wanted to get an idea, was, are you sure, is that gross or net? And do you have any idea of the mix of payers that they have in Brattleboro? How many are really self-pay versus Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial? No, you know, I really don't know the uh, breakdown. Um, that is their published rate for the type of um, medically supervised treatment that they offer. So we will be offering uh, our services at a very uh, similar, uh, at least their published rate, whether that's a published rate that they negotiate, uh, that they lower, you know, I really cannot tell you. I don't know what the mix, the pair mix is for them, but it is their published rate. Okay, because typically what we see when we deal with published rates, and I can't speak specifically, you know, at Brattleboro, we can talk about, you know, in the hospitals, but typically a published rate, um, the insurance company would pay about 70% of that, Medicare would pay about 45, and Medicaid would pay about 35. So just, just from a perspective, it's, it's probably lower what they expect, what they actually get. Yes. Um, so when you're basing it on that, again for Vermonters, do we do you have any idea what percent of Vermonters um, are self-pay for detox versus you know using their you know going to a, a place that uses their commercial insurance or? You know, that is a question that we try to uh, answer. Uh, I look everywhere. If some of you have uh, a tip to give me here of what may be a good source of information, we look very, very hard at how many Vermonters leave Vermont to actually get this type of care since it is not available in Vermont, the type of, uh, you know, very uh, personalized individual care, high uh, staff to patient uh, ratio type of care. And we didn't find uh, any information. You know, the information that we actually, the assumptions are based on conjecture. As I show you on the table, you know, there are percentages that we think are individuals that are looking for um, specialty uh, facilities, specialized facilities, and that's that's the extent of it. Uh, I am not aware, and again, I, I would love for one of you to suggest where I could look at um, the number of Vermonters that uh, leave the state to get that type of care. They cannot get it in Vermont. So for those individuals who are interested in that type of care, where do they go? Yeah. And, I, and I think that's, you know, kind of one of the underlying things, both from Vermonters and nationally, where I just have concern about whether you'll achieve your, your revenues that you're projecting, which is, you know, how many people for, for a detox seven to ten day type facility pay self-pay, knowing that right now the current model, and I know you're, you're changing the model a little bit, but the current model may be that they would go to that type of facility, you know, at a Betty Ford or something, and then go into, you know, continue on in, in that facility for another 30, 60, 90 days. And so I'm not sure how many standalone detox that are not affiliated with um, something like a Betty Ford or Hazleton, you know, how many of those exist, because for many families, this might be the first expense of a much bigger expense if they're doing it, you know, if they're looking at it as a detox and then moving into maybe a 30 day or 60 day, yes. which could be another 30 or $45,000 for something. Yes. So, you know, that's yes. kind of my concern about this model is that you're expecting the majority of the people to come from out of state Yes. for a seven to ten day and then need to filter back into their communities either into a longer term 
for something like that. So I'm just the concern would be, you know, as people research this, are are you going to be able to make that case so much early on, right? Right now, before you have evidence yet, and we don't have a facility for them to go to right after. So, you know, the question is really, you know, are how many standalone detoxes are there? that are there, completely self-pay that do not affiliate with somebody else. Yeah, there are many. Uh, there are many. There are also obviously uh, a majority out of state. Uh, also, uh, again, you know, not everybody needs a, a 30 or 60 day uh, rehab program afterwards. I mean, we uh, we believe that our program will stabilize patients to the point where they may actually have uh, access to an outpatient clinic or, or, or some other sort of, of non-residential. You know, not everybody needs to go through a, a 30 and 60 uh, days. Um, obviously, we will... Um, have uh, arrangements depending on where the patient comes from and what the, the, their, their preference and their family preference is to uh, place them in other states. Um, the, the, uh, there is no doubt that this is going to be an expensive first uh, step, but, you know, for us, again, the whole notion uh, behind the business model and the treatment model is that it is expensive, but it's great value. And that we are, how long is it going to take us to collect the data to prove that is obviously an excellent question. Uh, from my point of view, you know, the sooner the better. And this is why we are going to be prioritizing and putting a lot of resources on tracking medical outcomes because we need to prove effectiveness. We need to prove that though this is an expensive 10-day stay in the overall treatment of your chronic disease, it's a very effective first step. Um, but, you know, uh, the, 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 we all know it. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, and we need to actually collect um, data to support that, that statement. Okay. Um, and then, uh, you know, that brings me to really some of the financial statements. And I know there's a bunch of the, the model changed a bit, so I'm not sure, you know, if uh, you can kind of help with answering some. But it looks like at the start, it looked like there was going to be maybe a million capital contributed, but now it looks like it's going to be 2650. Yep. So is that correct? That is correct. So, you know, it, it's been a... Um a process of refining uh, the model, uh, the business model, uh, the debt um, component, uh, the, uh, uh, the extent of uh, the work that is being done to retrofit the building, um, you know, the type of facility that we want to build, the type of facility that is going to compete with facilities across the country at the highest level, uh, requires a, a much bigger um, investment in the rebuilding and therefore the rent that we have to pay. So, you know, for the contractor to to actually engage in the risk of rebuilding that um, facility, we needed to sign a lease with a, a, a rent that was uh, uh, required for the first uh, year, uh, and that's what actually then changed the raise for capital. And, uh, you know, the, the amount now has no debt, and a capital raise of $2.6 million. Okay. And when you talk about the retrofit of the building and the rent, and I know there were two leases in, in there, um, so are we now at a lease where it's about 500000 a year? Because there was a lease where it's six hundred, and then six hundred dollars prepaid. Y yes. You know, the, the amount, the, uh, there's only one lease. I think that there, there was, uh, you know, an, an early lease that uh, – was just a model of it. Uh, the second one that came, I believe, with the third set of questions is okay. the, uh, the one that actually applies. And, uh, yes, it's, uh, we, we are paying uh, $50,000 uh, per month, I believe. That's the amount. And are you still paying up front 
the, the we are paying and and this is what I think is important right that the 2.6 million is really the proceeds are going to be used all for operations there's absolutely not a single cent that is going to the partners of this LLC uh, so the the money goes for rent uh, goes for salaries to start the operations and uh, we have, as you saw uh, from our projections, we need around 400 and some thousand dollars as cushion um, in the first four months of operations. So uh, all of the proceeds are going to go directly for working capital and uh, nothing of it goes to the uh, founding uh, partners of uh, the venture. And do you know how much the retrofit of the building is going to cost? I, uh, uh, I think we have Doug uh, Moses. Uh, I don't know if Doug is still. Are you still online, Doug? I don't know if I'm you here, Willie. Yeah. Uh, or or uh, Greg, uh, uh, Greg Beldock, uh They are the. Uh, they'll be my my landlords. Um, and they are the ones that are keeping uh, track of construction costs. So, Greg, I don't know if you want to uh, comment on the the cost of retrofitting the building, please. Before you start, Greg. Mm -hmm. All right. This is this is Michael Barber. Um, uh, happy to have you answer the question, um, but I do need to swear you in if you're going to be providing any sort of evidence. So, do you mind doing that? Absolutely, Michael. It'll be the second time I lifted my yeah. hand as Willie was being sworn in earlier, but not on schedule. Okay. So let's do it again. All right. Um, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And could you just spell your last name for me, please? Sure. It's B E L D O C K. Thank you. As, as, we had done in the past, and we have built uh, assisted living facilities, independent living facilities, and uh, we're innovative in the memory care, uh, the growth of memory care, and, and a change in the way memory care and Alzheimer treatment was done throughout the country, beginning with the facilities. We suggested an offer to Willie that the most successful way for his financial uh, a plan to, to move forward that which would provide the greatest likelihood would be is that if the landlord provided all the internal fit up to the building including the medical equipment the software um, the, the the phone system which speaks to an attenuation system which also allows uh, for scheduling models and all of that will be provided by the landlord it's about a 3.6 million dollar internal fit up Okay, that makes some sense then in what the rent payment maybe is, because um, I was looking at a purchase of the building. In addition to the purchasing of the real estate, well, the purchase, purchase of the real estate would be on top of that. Pardon? Yes, yeah, but one point two million for the real estate, right? Well, it was one point two five zero, so we're talking about a four point seven million dollar uh, capital event. Uh, a, a good portion of that is very specific. The, the furnitures are high end, the beds are specific, and obviously the software uh, system and the attenuation uh, tracking system. Uh, when I say tracking, we actually tracking labor as they enter and leave rooms, not unlike we did in many uh, memory care facilities, which has now been adopted nationally. Thanks. And um, really, my last question that brings me to is then the financial statements where um, and and uh, will you just refer to it a little bit about the additional cash that you have? And, you know, just that's where there's concern for me looking at your financials where and I was looking at your three year performer balance sheet uh, as of 220. I think it was under question one. So I don't know if that's since changed. But it had you, I'm sure the timing has changed, but it had cash getting down to about 214000 in month four. And that's assuming that you had generated already about a million dollars in accounts receivable, you know, that's going to offset that. So 
um, what is your ability going to be to raise additional capital or to fund, you know, a shortfall in cash if you hit the revenue assumptions that you've had in here? You know, it's a uh, uh, pre-COVID-19. <laughs> I would have told you that uh, my ability to raise capital is absolutely excellent. Um, I cannot tell you how motivated I have raised money for many ventures. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be successful in those ventures, and and my investors have always been very, very loyal to me. Um, there, this project is a project that people understand as doing very well by doing a lot of good. And I do think that um, the uh, COVID-19, you know, situation has uh, made everything a little bit more model. I can tell you that I continue to, because these are individuals that have backed me in other ventures, uh, the ability to go back to them for extra cash, uh, again, I am under oath. So before COVID-19, 100% sure. Now, you know, a little bit less sure. But I do think that this is a type of project that has always generated a tremendous amount of excitement on people that want to make money. And this is a model that eventually will have, I believe, attractive returns for investors, but more importantly, are committed to make a difference. And, and I think that, you know, again, I've been involved in a lot of business. Lots of them have had this do well, do good. Um, people have always been very responsive for, you know, a capital call that um, is uh, in an emergent situation. I mean, when, you know, for reasons that are not uh, predictable at this point, we have a shortfall. Um, I feel that um, my investment are going to be there. One other point that I want to make is that I have no debt, right? And so at this time, I mean, talking about, again, a post-COVID-19 world, uh, I think banks are going to be so incredibly pushy trying to get people to borrow money. They are going to, you know, everything is right now leading to much greater liquidity. And I believe that loans are going to be a plenty at ridiculously low rates. So though I have built the model on a 100% equity, no debt, in case that there are some issues with the capital call, given what has happened with the markets right now, I feel that banks are going to be extremely pliable and will have plenty of funding available for us. Oh, and I do have one follow-up on that piece, which is, um, I guess, you know, talking a little about your corporate structure and how, how investors will get a return and when you see that happening. Um, being is it going to be just, you know, at some point you're going to start distributing dividends to them or yep. liquidation event ultimately down the road where, you know, people will get their money back or, or how do you see that playing out? Yeah, the, the structure is, is a, a very typical. You know, we are going to give uh, back to investors 80% uh, of profits uh, until they get completely paid out. And after that, they will get 20% of the profits down the road. Okay. So, um, you know, they, they get preferential treatment until their investment is paid out. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, uh, Member Pelham, do you have any questions? I do. Um, uh, Let's see. So let me um, just on um, a kind of a combination of, of, of data. Hold that on a second. In. Tom, at least I was having some trouble hearing you. If you could start that again. Yes, that would okay. be helpful. I'm sorry. I had my phone on mute, so I was saying something and nobody heard me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at some of the data that is on slide six and slide 16. You know, where there's these topside numbers of in Vermont of 
54,000 people older than 12 with a substance abuse disorder um, and only 13% of them uh, in treatment. And then for your third year in, on, uh, I think it's slide 16, you expect there to be 90 Vermonters um, in that population of, of when you're fully up and running. And I'm just wondering where you think those 90 people are coming from. Are they coming from existing providers in Vermont that would be diverted toward your program, or would they be coming, um, or, or would these be new people um, <clears throat> to um, this kind of care? Um, my my sense would be that they wouldn't be new people if they could afford to pay cash or pay up front for this benefit. They're probably getting it somewhere. So I'm just trying to get a sense. I know it's at the margin, but you know, the folk, part of the focus here is, is, is this helpful to Vermonters? And I, I'd like your sense of whether or not the, those uh, 90 people are new to the system, bringing fresh money into Vermont, or is it just kind of rearranging the, uh, uh, the, the, the provider? Right. Uh, again, you know, I appreciate the question. The, the, um, the answer is that we don't know. Uh, you know, we don't know how many Vermonters are leaving Vermont to get this type of care. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I wish I could actually tell you, and again, uh, if any of you could guide me to where I could find that out, but where do individuals are looking for a, a high staff to patient ratio, small facility with individualized care go? You know, what is the number of patients that leave Vermont? Because that number would be very helpful. I could actually say that um, we would retain those, right? Let's say that 100 people leave Vermont every year to get this kind of treatment. I could argue that I will then bring that money that they're spending in other facilities out of state to Vermont. But we don't have that number. The number 90, you know, is based on looking at the, not, the percentage of people that, and, and, and we know that here in Vermont, have actually uh, private, paid with private insurance or cash, and they actually have uh, gone to a residential treatment facility. So the, the number 90 is what we expect to treat uh, given who has seek treatment in Vermont. And when you say is it new, is it a reshuffle of the number, you know, what we hope uh, is that 90 patients in Vermont will get the best treatment possible. Are these 90, 90 that were treated before by someone else, somewhere else, and they're coming back after a relapse to see us? I don't know. I don't know if there are going to be 90 patients that are totally new. There are going to be some that actually are trying us, you know, because it's the third or fourth time that they attempt to get treatment for this chronic disease. So it, I, I really cannot answer your question specifically. What I do know is that I'm hoping we're going to treat 90 patients in Vermont very, very effectively. And could we treat more? I hope that more Vermonters would come, but we expect that those 90 patients will be treated as well as anywhere else here in Vermont. So, um, again, the key answer to your question, the key data to answer your question, unfortunately, I don't have. We've looked, and that is how many individuals go out of state for this kind of treatment. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think it's pretty certain, though, that those 90 patients are ones that can afford to pay up front. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a condition, right, for us to treat them. So, yes, the, the, you're, you're absolutely correct. Okay. Next, uh, um, do you have any, you, you mentioned, I think, the retreat uh, on slide 10, not explicitly, sorry. but. I'm no. sorry, I missed 
something there. Um, you mentioned, I think, is where I got to. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, it's bad, bad uh, uh, internet out here, Robin. I'm sorry. I'll speak slowly if I can. Um, on slide 10, I think the reference was to the Brattleboro Retreat as the only other um, ASAM 3.7 class facility in Vermont. Do you have any sense of the percent of their patient load of that far? It's, uh, again, a very, very good question. They don't report it, so we don't know. You know, they offer us, as uh, I'm sure you're very well aware, several different treatment modalities, and they don't break down their number of patients in each of those modalities. So they offer the, um, the highest level of medical supervision, but they don't report how many patients they have at that level. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, I think, when we were looking at slide 14, that uh, your intent is to build a world-class facility that would attract people who have world-class expectations, let's say. And um, I had a staff analysis a while back. Um, it, this may have changed that your fixed cost investments in the first year would be about $1.2 million, uh, which divided by 32 is $36,000 per bed. And I'm just, um, and, but the range of what were called fixed cost, property taxes, et cetera, um, I'm just wondering, do you have any sense from a construction point of view how much per bed will be invested in making this facility a world-class facility? Again, I, you know, uh, we have no role in, in construction, but, um, and, and, and Greg Baldock, who, who is, uh, the CEO of uh, Bulwark Corporation in charge of construction is on the line, so he may correct me, but he mentioned, right, that if you, uh, don't take the price of the real estate, which was $1.2 million, uh, and you look at the construction, which is $3.6 million, uh, it is, uh, if you divide it by, by 32, you're talking about $120,000, uh, per bed, basically, and $240,000 per room, 16 rooms. So if you want to make the calculation based, I don't know if it is a fair calculation because there are so many other facilities. I mean, uh, uh, spaces, uh, kitchen, and so forth. But if you actually look at the total amount of construction costs, which I understand from uh, from Greg is 3.6 million, then uh, you're looking at 120 thousand dollars or so per bed. Thank you for that. This is Greg Beldock. Willie, if you're looking at your operating cost and your initial loss over the first 19 months and you add your capital costs in total, your depreciable capital costs, it's identical to a memory care facility. It's about $160,000 a bed uh, before your cash flow. Thank you. Thank um, you. On page, uh, on slide 15, uh, you referenced that um, 1% of profits will be grants to a community-based organization addressing addiction. And I'm just wondering what in year three, when you're fully up and running, in terms of dollars, what does 1% equal? That's a very good question. Uh, I mean, again, from my lips to the ears of God, as they say, uh, if we are successful in the way that we want to be successful, uh, we are going, the 1% is going to represent, in terms of profitability, is going to represent around sixty to $70,000. And that uh, distribution um, would be um, before distributions to um, investors? Sure. I mean, this will be actually a built-in distribution 
that will be seen as a basic, you know, let me just call it a, a cost of doing business, right? So we will actually be investing uh, that 1%. We think that obviously uh, it, it will be to everybody's benefit here. Uh, it's very important. Again, I don't know if I was clear in the description of how that money is going to be uh, spent, right? That uh, 1% will go to an independent board. We are going to uh, invite people from the community. We have names already that have been suggested to us, and that board will actually have full authority and independence on spending and allocating those monies as they see fit. We will have a mission, and the mission is that it has to be invested in community uh, organizations that deal obviously with the treatment of addiction um, and we will actually earmark uh, northern Vermont as the area where we would like that investment to happen but that's the extent of it then the board independently of us will be spending and allocating those monies thank you um, you did make that clear during your presentation um, the next question I have is uh, maybe just a follow-up, a, a, a reiteration of one I think Robin raised, which was um, uh, in the responses to question, the, the third response to questions on page five, um, you uh, showed a distribution of the types of benefits that, um, uh, you know, af aftercare or benefits services that people would get after discharge. And I just want to make the point that um, not only were there time amounts on that chart on page five, but dollar amounts. And the dollar amount was $131 per patient, um, you know, for the entire year after discharge. And I just um, so it's it's interesting to look at time, but it's also you know what what the expenditure was the expenditure to be associated with the time and. I um, I can't get my arms around $131 uh, per patient on average. So if you could speak to that a little bit more, um, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit um, difficult to, to really put a, a number of dollars because ultimately we have staff that is working full 40-hour shifts a week, um, and they will spend whatever time they need to spend on making sure that the placement and discharge uh, of our patients is, is appropriate. The number that we actually provided, and this was in response to a question, you know, it's, uh, uh, we responded to the question, not, not really questioning whether the question made sense when we actually responded to it. But, you know, we are not allocating a separate amount of money to the, uh, the, the, the follow-up. This is going to be an integral responsibility of our aftercare specialists. This is going to be a responsibility of the executive director. Uh, I am sure that some patients will require less. There's going to be uh, some patients that require more. Um, so I just want to put the caveat that the dollar amount was really based on an average salary of an aftercare specialist, but it is most likely, you know, undercounting the salary, for example, of the clinical and executive directors that may get involved. Maybe uh, that uh, the direct case staff and the counselors will get involved. So the number that we provided was based on the question that we were asked. And basically they said, how much time do you think that you're going to spend? Uh, as you know from, from, from Robin's questions, it was five hours on average per patient. And then the question was, how much money you think that represents? And then we multiply it by the hourly rate of an aftercare specialist. Um, and that's how we came up with the $130. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, if you're interested in the mechanics of how we got there, uh, that's how we did. Um, I, I believe that because this is such a high priority 
for the reputation of silver pines, for the success of silver pines, for the effectiveness of our treatment, that it's basically a floor. Uh, $130 or five hours per patient is maybe the minimum amount that we're going to spend, but it's a good estimate. And just as I answered before, I think with time, we'll be able to refine these estimates uh, much more specifically. Thank you. Um, just to, to go back a little bit in terms of this 90 per monitor number um, that is on uh, uh, slide 16, I think, and as well as on slide 32, what what is your definition of a Vermonter? <laughs> it's a, do I even uh, attempt to, <laughs> to define a Vermonter? You know, I've been here for 37 years. I know that not a lot of people consider me uh, a Vermonter, not even with my accent from Charlotte here. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we consider them residents of Vermont, right? I mean, that would be the definition of a Vermonter is someone that actually is a resident of the state. Well, thank you. I'll just, uh, just as a side note, um, that the, the chair of our board, because he comes from Rutland and I come from, came from Arlington, he does not consider me a Vermonter because I'm, <laughs> I'm really from Massachusetts in his mind. Um, the um, last question I have is on slide six, and um, I note that kind of the way you did the math in terms of 424 LADCs, and uh, um, and then you have a projection in the first year at, at, at the three that you will be using or, or um, employing. Sorry, Tom, you're breaking up. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me. Let me let me try again. So you you reference on slide 36 uh, 424 LADCs um, uh, in Vermont, and that you in year one would be employing three of those plus or minus, and year three six. And so the percentages that you derive are quite low at seven tenths of one percent at 1.4 percent, but the actual incidence of those hires would probably be not be spread evenly across the entire state um, and that they might have a much more localized impact on service providers that are in your same field um, that are you know close more closely located loca located uh, to stow so i'm just wondering um, um, uh, if you uh, if you have a concern that in the more immediate area of Stowe that your ability to pay more um, would be, would be uh, detrimental to any of the specific organizations right. local to Stowe. Yeah. You know, I, I again, we, we are thinking here of a zero-sum game. You know, we, we're, we think that we cannot attract more uh, licensed alcohol and drug counselors to Vermont. Um, I, I am uh, confident that if we have the type of facility that we want to, uh, people will actually come to work here. They will come to Vermont. Uh, they will come to Stowe. You know, part of the reason uh, that uh, we decided to create this clinic in Stowe is that we do think that it's an attractive destination, not only for patients, but for people to work. Um, you know, this notion that there's only 424 counselors in the state of Vermont and it's a zero-sum game and there will be no additions. I mean, this is an area that we all know is getting worse, addiction that is, addiction treatment. I think people are looking for work and jobs. And this is like an area where I can you know, bet we will have more individuals coming into this area. So, you know, I haven't really done a census of, of where these counselors live and deliver services in the state of Vermont. Uh, I do believe that uh, given the quality of what we are attempting to do, uh, the quality of the staff that we're going to have, that people will actually move to be close to this job. We're going to pay well. Uh, we're going to make them proud of what they're doing. 
Uh, they're going to be associated with one of the premier treatment centers in the country. I think people will drive from, uh, you know, move from Bennington if need be, uh, to be uh, associated with us. So, you know, it, it's the, the, the business professor here. I have a little bit of, of trouble uh, seeing how the, uh, the workforce is static, right? I think that there will be uh, some some dynamics here that will make uh, the numbers that we are hiring really not particularly significant in establishing pressures uh, within the state. Well, thank you for that. I, I just raised that because, um, you know, as they know, for example, many of our smaller hospitals are um, Sorry, Mr. Um, breaking up again. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Um, so that many of Vermont hospitals are, are running red ink significantly. And yep. so these small marginal impacts are of much more significance because they don't have cushions in their bottom line. And so I think one perspective would be that you're projecting a very, uh, at least by the second year of break point and a very healthy relatively third year. Um, and with uh, net revenues that are, are in the black um, in an environment where health care providers in Vermont are in the red. And it's just, it's just a, uh, um, a thought that I want to keep in mind. Uh, that's in my question. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, sorry, did you want to respond to that? Well, I mean, I think that your the, the point is very well uh, taken, and I understand it. And the uh, you know the the, the reason that uh, we have this model um, is precisely to avoid being in the red if we can. So I, I understand the, the challenges and difficulties of, uh, of, of of the hospital setting in in, in Vermont for sure, and our. Uh, Pay model is based on trying to avoid those pressures, those financial pressures. But uh, the point is very well taken, and I, I hear you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to go to Board Member Holmes. Member Holmes, are you? Looks like you're maybe on mute still. I'm on mute. Sorry. Now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, yeah. Thank <laughs> I, you. I'm going to start, I think, you know, and I'm going to try and be uh, somewhat brief given we've had a lot of time and a lot of my questions have been addressed already, but I wanted to focus on Vermont need a bit, which some of my colleagues on the board have already addressed uh, a little bit, but I want to take it from a different angle. Um, since our focus really is whether this project meets Vermont need, um, or that's one large part of the focus. There is one other, you know, ASAM 3.7 facility in Vermont that's available. So one of your comments is this would be a good addition to Vermont and a second facility. And you claimed earlier in the presentation you want to have a major impact locally. Um, so when I look at your number you gave, um, you know, the 9634 that was on slide 16, those would be admitted patients 18 and above, and we look at your 18% of that number that needs residential treatment, we're talking about about 1,734 Vermonters that need help on an annual basis. Yep. And you're building capacity for about 1,000, right? You know, if you look at your year three capacity, yep. uh, it's, it's over 1,000, although you're only going to have 900 or so. Yes. Um, but so you're only taking 90 of the 1,734, so that's about 5%, roughly speaking, of, of the actual need in Vermont, right. despite the fact that you're building capacity um, for much more than that. And I recognize that that's largely uh, because of your pay model, right, because of the self-pay. As soon as you add in Medicare, Medicaid as a payer, that's not your business model. That eliminates a large fraction of the need in the state. Is that right? 
That is that is right. I just would like to make sure that when you say take, right, I mean, I, we will take anybody that wants to pay. So the 90 is what we think is the floor, right? And it's based on the census data that we have. But it could be much more. How much more? Right. Again, I don't think anybody really knows. But yes, uh, what you said is absolutely true. Well, you're, you, had, you had put in there about 14% of patients admitted are either private insurance or cash, right? That's, so that means 85% are probably either uninsured, unable to pay, or on Medicare or on Medicaid, right, from, yeah. from your assessment. Yes. Okay. Um, and I understand the financial model that you've designed is to avoid the financial pressures. Um, you know, by having self-pay and pay up front. But I'm wondering if you've, to some degree, considered externalities that you may be generating. Um, and the way I'm thinking about it is you had talked about in the first year having about 15% of the market share of self-pay, up to by year three having 35% of the market share of self-pay. And this is just in Vermont. So we're talking about just the Vermont self-pay market. Correct. Um, is that right? That is correct. Okay. So my concern is that as you increase market share, there mm -hmm. are other facilities in the state that rely on the self-pay population to cross-subsidize the underpayment of our public payers. That's not, so, I think, an assumption. That's a statement that uh, uh, is not proven. You just said is possibly true, but possibly not. We don't know how many people that actually are willing to pay leave the state. So your assumption that that I'm actually, again, it's a zero-sum game, that I'm going to actually have all of the patients that self-pay from other um, uh, uh, facilities come to Silver Pines may be true, but what we think we're doing really is providing something that the state doesn't have. Uh, and that the individuals in the state that currently go out of state will stay in state. So it's not like I'm actually taking patients away from Brattleboro Retreat specifically. Uh, I am actually hoping to keep Vermonters that are going out of state for the type of treatment that we're offering in state. So it's a net gain. Mm -hmm. and, and what evidence do you have that you will not be taking any patients from Brattleboro Retreat? We have actually, uh, again, uh, the question is how many, uh, to, to answer your question directly, I have no evidence because Brattleboro Retreat really doesn't publish how many individuals are actually going for ASAM 3.7 treatment modalities. Uh, the, the numbers uh, that uh, they, they treat uh, may, again, I don't know if they self-pay. So the question that you're asking me, uh, we don't have data on, right? What I would need to know from the Brattleboro Retreat, and they don't publish this and don't share this data, is how many individuals that are being treated at ASAM 3.7 are actually self-paying. Right. Yeah. And um, in number, we may or may not obviously attract them. But again, the whole concept here is to bring individuals that are in the state and taking their dollars elsewhere to keep them in Vermont. Um, and I, I guess this is the same line of questioning around um, you refer to, and this has been brought up a little bit before, but you refer to uh, the creation, your words, of 55 well-paying jobs. Yeah. And, you know, I think that I understand your point that it may not be a zero-sum game and the labor force is dynamic and there may be some out-of-state uh, employees who are willing to come to Vermont to work at a high quality facility that's paying well. But there's also the possibility, and I think ADAP brings this up, that you could be depleting 
you know, uh, some of our much needed workforce that's caring for the more vulnerable populations, largely those in Medicaid and Medicare. So I, I think there's a concern about that. And I, I, I hear what you say and I, and I hope that we, you can, if this CON is approved, bring in folks from other, uh, other states. Certainly we need an increased workforce in the state of Vermont. But there is a concern that you would be taking, you know, your clinic, you have 37 clinical providers. That's uh, four providers, 12 nurses, and four counselors. Um, and they, that combined group of individuals would be serving 36 to 90 Vermonters. My question would be if those even 20 providers were deployed in other Vermont addictive settings, could they serve more Vermonters and have more impact? And again, I know it's a hard question to answer, but I look at the number of, of clinical staff that you're going to have there. Yeah. I almost think about the provider to Vermonter ratio, and I think about it that way a little bit. And it concerns me, especially when we're getting, um, you know, letters from ADAP and the Department of Health that are concerned about the impact on the Vermont system. Yeah, the, the question, I mean, again, is a very complex question that you're asking. Uh, there's a philosophical level, right? And that is, whose responsibility is it to provide that kind of care? I mean, it, it is hard to argue, right, that you want to keep salaries low so that you don't put pressure on the state. It is actually hard to argue from an economical development point of view that creating jobs and good paying jobs is bad for the state. In terms of actually providing jobs that uh, serve the um, under serve underprivileged um, uh, socially uh, uh, challenge economically speaking uh, population uh, whose responsibility is is that right uh, we have a model that is doing uh, what I think an addition to the environment in Vermont. We're not detracting, we're adding. Uh, are there some needs that we are not addressing? Absolutely. I mean, we are not trying to serve everybody in Vermont. We have made a choice. Uh, we think that we are going to deliver a service that is in great need in Vermont to maybe some very few individuals, but it's a need that they don't right now fulfill in, in, in Vermont, and the responsibility for taking care of a lot of other patients uh, may fall onto someone else. The, the, the notion that we are going to create some pressures by hiring 20 people, if I take the numbers that you mentioned, which are the numbers in year three, so this is not like it's going to happen like a switch from, you know, one day to the other, but it's going to happen over 36 months. I mean, there's a lot of graduates of programs around the country, uh, certainly around Vermont, certainly at the University of Vermont, that will be looking for jobs. And I hope that the state and I hope that other entities in the state will take the responsibility to develop jobs for those individuals. We need them to stay in Vermont. And the argument that we are going to create, and yes, I'm using that word because right now they don't exist, these jobs, uh, I can hardly understand why that has a negative impact. I mean, I think that if I hear what our governor is saying, what we need is jobs, good jobs, jobs that actually address, you know, a very important need. So, you know, I could I think the issue is, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think the issue is we're currently facing a workforce shortage in the state of Vermont. So if we were not currently facing a workforce shortage in Vermont, it would be a different story. But, but I hear what, what you're saying, and I don't want to belabor no, the point. But let me just, I, I, this is important because this is really economic policy here. So you mean that because we have a workforce shortage, we shouldn't create new businesses? Are you saying that because we have a workforce shortage in healthcare, we shouldn't come up with new treatments that could help people? I mean, again, for me, this is thinking of a zero-sum game. Yeah. If we believe in the ability of an economic system to grow, 
He will create jobs. He will create really great jobs. And you talk about externalities. For me, the ability to create 55 very good paying jobs in a little town like Stoke, Vermont, where I live, I can tell you that that will have a huge impact on convenience stores, on gas stations, on grocery stores. I mean, we're talking about making an impact not only on the addiction uh, <clears throat> population here, but to add to the economic landscape. And this notion that we have a workforce shortage, so please don't open anything else because we may actually create a negative result. I, you know, it, it, it's a hard argument for me to understand. I hear it. I understand that it's a challenge. Uh, and, and I do think that this is public policy uh, much more than you know, a certificate of need for a new business. Well, we just have to ensure that what we decisions we make don't compromise access to other Vermonters. So that's the, the line of questioning is around that. Um, yeah. You, I just want to uh, ask yeah. you a little bit. So you talk about um, the cost of non-Vermonters straining the uh, emergency rooms and inpatient site capacity would be less than the benefit of avoided ED visits that Vermonters uh, would gain if they sought the treatment at the Silver Pine Center um, mm -hmm. facility. Yeah. I didn't really see an attempt to, to try and quantify that cost-benefit analysis. My guess is that would be challenging. Um, I just want to say that, you know, even eight inpatient psych um, non-Vermonter needs, you know, in eight, eight non-Vermonters needing eight beds in an inpatient psych facility seems small, but it's actually significant. We have a huge issue with mental health borders in our emergency rooms and not enough psych capacity in the state. So it may seem like a small number, but I just want to, you know, articulate to you that this is an area where we're already struggling in, in Vermont. You. So we have to be Thanks. concerned about exacerbating it. Yeah, no, I, I, I am fully aware of that. I want you to know that, again, I am extremely familiar with uh, inpatient psychiatry treatment. Uh, I have, again, in my work, suicide work with three of the best psychiatrists in this state. Uh, so I know the challenges that they face every day. I'm very much aware of that challenge. Uh, I want you to know that the, the, the timing was not um, right. Uh, we have a letter of support from uh, Dr. Toby Horn, uh, who is the director of inpatient psychiatric services uh, at VMMC. Uh, and uh, Dr. Horn, very uh, specifically, um, they look, would be very, if, I don't know, uh, Mike, what the, the, the limitations of the protocol are here uh, of adding information and so forth, but this letter came in at the beginning of the week, and uh, uh, it was beyond the deadline of Friday when I needed to submit uh, the presentation and other documentation to the board. But in that letter, he actually supports the creation of an, of an entity like Silver Pines for the reasons that we're speaking of, and that is that, though you're right, the cost effectiveness, the cost benefit of how many people are you actually um, uh, helping to, to uh, avoid emergency department services is, is, is challenging. Uh, uh, Toby is saying, hey, you know, uh, I think the impact that you're going to have on the uh, substance use disorder population is significant. Uh, the only other thing I'm going to say, and again, you know, that, that goes, it's not my research, it's not the work that I do, so uh, I need to quote just the, uh, the sources in the literature, is that a dollar that is spent uh, in, in, in uh, uh, detox uh, environments actually generates $12 of savings in emergency services down the road. Um, you know, that's a number that has been used, so uh, it's a number that, um, you know, I am actually quoting in the presentation, and 
again, I, I, I have not uh, experienced that, but I am actually um, using that as a point of reference as to what the impact of our services will be. Okay. And my last question is actually on the slide that you have up on the screen now. Um, your chief medical officer, can you just clarify addiction fellowship trained and or board certified psychiatrist or primary care physician? I, I ask that because um, I know you had mentioned in the application that best practices really integrate mental health services into the treatment. So it seemed to me having a psychiatrist would be really important, particularly yes. if you're going to be administering medications. But then the and or could be a primary care physician. It seems like there's a big difference between a primary care physician's capabilities in mental health and a psychiatrist. So can you just clarify that for me? Yeah. Again, uh, let me just tell you what my preference is, right? Board certified psychiatrist with an addiction fellowship. I mean, that would be what we uh, are going to be looking for and trying to recruit for. Uh, again, we all, you know, just to your, to your previous question, this is Vermont. Uh, there are a lot of individuals that actually have that profile. The key for me is the addiction fellowship, is to have the specialty in addiction. There are many primary care physicians there are many family um, practices in this country that are dealing with addiction directly. And if there is a primary care physician that we will hire would be someone that has extensive addiction training. We will then have a board certified psychiatrist on the staff, but maybe not as a chief medical officer. But ideally, right, I would like to have a board-certified psychiatrist with an addiction fellowship. That will be my ideal candidate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Willie, you had asked um, about the procedure for submitting the letter of support. You can do that after the hearing uh, at Tadana. We typically consider those as essentially public comments, which um, uh, so. Yeah, just send that to Donna after the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. I will do so. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you have questions? Kevin, you're on mute. If you're talking, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, I okay. can. Great. So it's like I started to say, <laughs> it's always good to be last because my colleagues have focused on some uh, real key areas that uh, I had been trying to hone in on, um, especially as it relates to the impact on other facilities in Vermont and other workforce and also the uh, financial uh, conditions. So questions will will just be some tweaks around the edges of what you've already discussed previously and I want to start by saying I truly appreciate your confidence in um, this venture uh, if I were in your shoes I would be uh, um, probably a lot more uh, trepid about uh, moving forward under uh, the current conditions and also um, I, I think I would have a, a lot more fear of success. But with that being said, um, first let's start with the financial uh, end of it. Um, your monthly lease payment, is that gross or is that triple net? Triple net. And um, what confidence that you have moving forward that there won't be significant increases on the additional charges? So once... Uh, I mean, this is a public record. Once um, Listers and Stowe see how much money is being put into the facility, it's likely that there will be an additional assessment. Um, have you calculated those type of uh, assumptions into uh, your projections? So, again, just to make sure that we all understand, right, I'm just a tenant, and uh, the implications of change in uh, property taxes, valuation of the property, and so forth, 
uh, will be absorbed by uh, the developer, right? Um, and, and I believe Greg Beldock is, is on the line, so he can address that directly. For us, you know, we have uh, a lease that actually sets our rent very specifically, right? We have a limit on the amount that they can increase that rent for the first three years. So, you know, the I, I, and, and uh, uh, Kevin, I appreciate uh, your your comments about um, the courage that it takes uh, to start a venture. You know, entrepreneurs are sometimes um, seen as uh, as foolish, but it is a business. Uh, that I believe will sustain uh, the projections that we have based on the need. Um, there is no doubt, to your comment, that in this particular environment, uh, raising capital is challenging. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind or the mind of the people that I've spoken to, Kevin, that says that addiction will get worse because of the, uh, the circumstances that we're going through. So, you know, nothing in the environment since November when we put together this application has actually changed in a way that tells me that the assumptions that we've made on demand for this service has in any way diminished. Uh, in all the conversations with professionals that I've had uh, through these four months, it's been a confirmation that the need is there. And so, I hope that, uh, that uh, we're right, and, and I, I certainly, this COVID-19 world, though it has made financing, private financing, private equity financing more challenging, uh, I, I think all the assumptions on demand have been actually strengthened. Okay, so there's been a lot of questions that focused on um, the impact on the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, I'm more concerned about uh, also the impact it could have on other facilities. Um, as you know, I'm uh, a former legislator, yes. and a lot of uh, times I uh, had to go to the mat to try to make sure that there was um, assistance to programs like Serenity House and other recovery programs in the area that I uh, represented. and. Um, I'm not so sure that this is strictly um, a Silver Pines versus Brattleboro Retreat as far as the type of patients. I think people enter into recovery programs for a number of reasons, and um, most importantly, based on what they think their personal success rate will be. So I'm curious um, if you've really given thought, you know, you you spent a lot of time talking about um, do well, but do good. And I just want to make sure that, um, you know, I, the 1% for recovery is great. It would be greater if it was 1% of revenues, not 1% of profits, because as you know, um, profits are an elusive target at times. Um, but with that being said, um, are you confident that you're really not impacting existing programs in the state of Vermont? We are offering such a different program. You know, uh, I, I, I do believe that we are offering something that is not being offered right now. Uh, when you talk about courage, Kevin, to start this venture, um, and again, a lot of people on this board uh, have started ventures of their own, I know. You need to find a service, a product that has not been offered, right? The chances of success are always, I think, in the entrepreneur based on a need that is not being fulfilled. And I believe that we are offering in Silver Pines an, an addition. And this is, you know, when you actually mentioned the word against Brattleboro Retreat. You know, I really don't think, I, I don't see the Brattleboro Retreat to be very fair as my competitor. I, I don't want to beat Brattleboro Retreat because I think we're looking for different type 
of patients. And, you know, our service is going to be very different from anything else that is offered in Vermont. So, you know, I see it as additive. Uh, uh, some of the comments that we've heard and that we've had is that we are detracting, that we're going to take away from. And I cannot tell you how from where I started this vision and this venture was about adding it was an additive to Vermont. Um, and, you know, you know better the state. I will, I, you know, in, in no way I, I will question that you have a much greater understanding of the needs of some of the, the Serenity House uh, turning point. You know, I really don't know the financial status and state of those organizations, but I do think that it will help. And look, you know, you mentioned that um, uh, 1% is not enough. With success comes generosity. And, uh, you know, right now what I can afford is to think about 1%. If we are really successful and we are more successful, 1% may not be the limit. I am actually making a commitment, and again, I'm under oath, and, you know, that I will at least provide 1%. Um, and I can assure you, Kevin, that there will be no hanky-panky accounting-wise. Um, <laughs> one percent profit will be one percent profits. And, you know, I, I, you don't know me, I, I, but I can tell you that uh, for me, a, a, a lot of what is driving the creation of this venture is to feel that I'm contributing. And, you know, that, that, that will be... Uh, uh, we'll start with 1%, and then you and I we can talk maybe three years from now, and uh, you can convince me to give more, and I think it will be uh, – uh, my arm will be easy to twist. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. Um, one other question that a lot of uh, concern was on post-discharge and the follow-up, and uh, there, were, there wasn't a lot of questioning on that. So I just want to um, – uh, what assurances can you give us that um, this isn't a scenario where somebody comes in, they put their money down, they get their, their 10 days, and then um, they're kind of left hanging as it goes out in the future? I'm, I'm curious, um, what type of uh, post-discharge plans would you have as far as communications with family providers, et cetera, that makes this work on the long term? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, again, this is, this is obvious, but l l let me just state it, uh, explicitly is that we are going to live or die by our medical outcomes. You know, we are going to live or die because we're charging a lot of money for a service, uh, based on the effectiveness of our program. And this charge, uh, planning and placing patients is key. It's a key metric of success for us. So, you know, to the, we, we've been asking the questions of um, how many hours we're going to be spending on post-discharge and so forth. I can tell you that it's a critical component of reputation. Um, for us to be able to attract new patients, uh, I cannot make a living attracting a patient, taking their money, and then not succeeding, right? Because that this is a community where that kind of um, uh, reputation gets known very, very quickly, right? We are going to make the placement, the post-discharge part of our treatment, Kevin, it's a critical component of the model that we have. Um, I, I wish I could, again, uh, give the board and all, all of you data. I hope we're going to have this conversation a couple of years, but I expect 100% placement in a, a, a program that will actually support what we did in the detox part of, 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 of the treatment and make us look very good. Part of what we think we we are doing here is that we're preparing patients for greater success at rehab. And the only way that we're going to prove this is by actually placing our patients in environments where they will get the 
the same type of treatment that we are delivering, you know, very effective. So uh, long answer to your question, placement is key for our success. It's going to be a priority for us from the beginning. Thank you. That's all the questions that I had at this time. I'll turn it back to Mike. Thank you, Go. Thank you. Um, so we are running a little late, um, but did want to give um, board members a quick opportunity to ask any follow-up questions that may have been spurred by other board questions. So if any board member has additional questions, please identify yourselves and um, and make it quick. Okay, I don't hear anything, so I'm going to assume there are no more questions, and we will proceed to the public comment portion of the hearing. So uh, same deal for public comment. Um, if you wish to make a comment, please uh, begin by stating your name. Uh, if you are here on behalf of an organization, what that organization is, and then provide your comment. Okay, I don't hear anyone. Um, so, like I said, uh, Doctor, if you want to submit that letter of support after the hearing to Donna, and uh, unless there's anything else, I think we'll close the hearing, and I'll turn it back over to Kevin for to close out the meeting. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Doctor, and. Um, for the board, uh, I know that we have a board meeting coming up in less than an hour. So um, at this point, unless um, someone has anything that needs to be discussed, uh, uh, we'll convene this hearing. And uh, um, I'll talk to all the board members again at 1 o'clock. Thank you, Mike, for your excellent uh, work as the hearing officer. And thank you, Doctor, for your um, very, um, very good presentation. and answering a lot of the uh, questions that we have, we have had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Maureen, good seeing you. It's been a while. Uh, and, and, Mike and, and, and Donna, I just want to, again, please, uh, for all of you, you know what fantastic staff you have. But I cannot uh, tell you how uh, helpful Donna has been throughout the process, and I want to thank her publicly. She's been just terrific. So thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. See everybody at one. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.